Hello again and uh, welcome to the fourth in the series of what I believe and why I believe it. Uh, there's lots going on in the world at the moment but uh, I don't want to get behind on these. So, so far in these talks I've talked about uh, the process of how I slowly, painfully got round to becoming a Christian and how I thought that being a Christian was sort of antithetical to rational thought and then I realised it wasn't. The journey I made up until that point took me loads of years, uh, not just a few weeks on YouTube, and I was stuck at the notion that the idea of God was reasonable, probable even, but, but no more than that. It was, there were just too many barriers towards any, any Christian faith. And so for the rest of this series, I really wanted to talk about those barriers that I had, and they were the problem of evil, how a good God can allow suffering, the miracles and the sort of Bible stuff, if you like, and chiefly, the one I'm going to talk about today, the resurrection, the biggie. So let's start with that. So my approach has always been, believe what you believe with integrity, don't be afraid of asking questions, listen without prejudice, and cope with the conclusions that you come to. Knowing that over the course of your life, if you live by those precepts, things may change. So that's what I did when I came to the resurrection. I was not ashamed of not believing in it. I asked questions, uh, I had the humility to listen to the answers, uh, and I tried to listen without prejudice. So how do I believe what I believe now? Well, embarrassingly enough, uh, just to make it clear, I sort of believe everything that the Bible tells me uh, that's about the resurrection. That's not always been the case, uh, not even all the way through my ordained life, and it may not stay the same, but just at the moment that's currently what I believe, pretty much the resurrection as is in the Bible. My problem for years was that it just sounded stupid. It was utterly credulous. It's the, in the league of tinfoil hat wearing, ghost hunting, ley line, sensing, credulous. It's something that was just outside a category that I could be in. And as someone who has always regarded themselves as a sort of scientific, no-nonsense rationalist, it's something of a humiliation to have to admit to believing in something which sounds like it does. It's quite a humbling experience. And so it wasn't an easy path for me to get there. There are many, many reasons not to believe in the resurrection. For a start, the Gospels, in terms of forensic evidence, are pretty shaky. They were written at the earliest 30 years after the resurrection, or after the event, uh, by people who wanted you to believe in it, so that it was a biased source. More than that, the first Gospel, Mark's Gospel, didn't originally end with the resurrection. It ended with an empty tomb, and the women who find the body running away frightened. So that pretty much ends it, yes? An empty tomb is not the same as a resurrection, and surely Mark would not leave the gospel like that if they had better evidence, and he wrote it 30 or more years after the event. So that's pretty much the case for the prosecution. Unreliable, biased sources, no contemporary evidence, and the earliest account with no evidence of the resurrection. And of course, not to mention the fact that people don't rise from the dead. So the first thing we need to do, if we're going to investigate this with integrity, is to judge what counts as reasonable evidence. And to do that we need to exercise some common sense. When we're investigating something that happened 2,000 years ago, we cannot expect the same amount of evidence as we would have in a court of law. To do that, your mind is already decided on the verdict, and the whole process of investigation is simply to prop up your preconceptions. There's no point in that. We need to have a historian's eye on this, not a, and a scholar's eye, but not a prosecutor's eye. Because as soon as you adapt that, you make it impossible to believe anything other than your current belief. And although we can't get back to the days surrounding the resurrection, we can do a little bit of forensics. Just as ballistics can look at an explosion and use, uh, use it to find where a bomb was set off, just, and just as scientists can trace things back to their origins, so we can gain some insight if we look at the evidence that we have for the lives of the Apostles who were closest to Jesus. In fact, Mark's Gospel isn't the earliest evidence of the Resurrection. That is in the letters of St Paul, which were written about 15 or more years 
after the event. So Mark would definitely have had resurrection stories that he knew about when he wrote his gospel. They were in existence. There was a purpose to him not including them. And that was because he wanted to throw people into the path of, of other Christians. He wanted to leave it on a cliffhanger so people would say, what happened next? And then people found out. Well, St Paul's letters are fascinating because what we can tell about St Paul's life before he was a Christian was that he hated Christians, hated them with a passion. Not that they were called Christians at that point, they were called followers of the way. But why did he hate them? Well, because he was a faithful Jew and they were committing a terrible blasphemy. They were saying that a man, Jesus, was not the, just the Messiah, he was a God. No Jew had ever claimed that before. Now, the Messiah was not a God figure to the Jews at all. He was an earthly leader anointed like royalty. And people were expecting a Messiah to come along and, and liberate people from the Romans. Claiming Jesus was the Messiah was one thing, but claiming that he was the Son of God would have struck every Jew as horrific, offensive. Turning Judaism into something which was more like the religion of their oppressors, the Romans. So what we can learn from the letters of St Paul and from the Acts of the Apostles is that we can learn that a bunch of Jewish men and women who thought they had found the Messiah, had seen him die, and decided that he wasn't in fact the Messiah, but he was God. And that's a big thing. That belief, in the eyes of most of the Jews, stopped the Christians being Jews and started them being blasphemers and outcasts, persecuted not only by the Romans, but by the Jews themselves. It made them the, wor the lowest of the low. And they went to their deaths, believing it was true. Now, I know people will die for something that they believe, even though they're mistaken in that belief. And I know that people will peddle a falsehood because people believe felt fake news. And perhaps, perhaps people will even die for something that they know to be untrue, but because there is an ideology behind it that they can get in front of. But none of those things fits the behaviour of those first Christians. There was no ideology to keep alive, there just wasn't one. It wasn't as though anybody had thought, OK, this is a lie, but it's a lie which houses a lot of virtue. Because they just hadn't developed a sort of theology of the resurrection at that point. They just didn't know what it meant. And I can't get my head around the idea that they could have been deceived into thinking that Jesus was alive, especially when it goes out of the way in the Bible to say how disbelieving the apostles were at first. When the women told the apostles, they say they thought it was an idle tale. Thomas resolutely doesn't believe. He demanded physical evidence. So I have to come to the conclusion that the apostles believed that the resurrection happened. That's all I'm saying just at this point. The apostles believed that the resurrection happened. I think that's the only sensible conclusion I could come to. And the apostles were in a position where they were sceptical enough to demand the sort of level of proof that I would want. But they were convinced. So at this point we have to turn to the Gospel stories, looking with a quizzical eye at what we are presented with. Firstly, Jesus appeared in some way to a number of people who knew him, but they didn't recognise him, at least at first. Secondly, there was an empty tomb with men dressed in white there, but no body. Thirdly, Jesus appeared and disappeared through a locked door. Fourthly, he was physically touchable. And fifthly, people only seemed to recognise him either when he said their name or when he performed a ritual act or when he said a, a ritual something like peace be with you or when he broke bread. <laughs> I mean, that's impenetrable to any sort of rational explanation. So what are the options that we have? Hallucination? Visions? Meeting someone else and retrodicting Jesus back in? Possibly. Nothing fits easily into what we're given. It all seems astonishingly unlikely. But the apostles died believing it was true, claiming it was the evidence of their own eyes. And that presents us with a problem if we want to 
push this down into rational thought. So it seems to me that the only two options that we have are someone might have stolen Jesus' body, and a lot of people had visions or hallucinations, some having them at the same time. In short, a bizarre but not impossible combination of things that we understand the mechanics of that happened to lead the apostles into believing that Jesus had risen from the dead. Or something happened that we don't currently understand, again, at least scientifically possible, but astonishingly unlikely, something that goes deeper into the laws of nature that we can currently understand, certainly nothing I can understand, which caused the apostles to believe in the resurrection. I can't really see a third option. I mean, I think, I think more than that, you'd either have to say that Jesus didn't exist at all, which I think would be stretching credulity too far, and that it was a, the whole thing was an invention, or there was a conspiracy to develop a deliberate lie on the part of the apostles. And again, I just can't see why they would do that, and why they would go to their deaths for the sake of it. Or perhaps, uh, you know, you, you said that, that every bit of the history is fictitious, um, and it's just a lie that snowballed out of control. But again, I just struggle to understand where in the point that that, that fiction happened. But I would say if you believe the, the two options that I think are the realistic ones, either the hallucination, vision, missing body theory, or the currently unknown science theory, you can with integrity call yourself a Christian. Because you know, as a result of these events, however they were done, a religion was formed which had its heart the notion of that God is love and that God is deeply involved in humanity. And again, if that was God's will, if it happened through natural processes, through the laws of nature, then it happened. And if you believe that that happened, if you believe that that religion was formed, however it was formed, and you believe in God, then it's not a big step to say that that was God's will, that that belief was formed. To my mind, I've often veered between those two options of the sort of hallucination theory and the, and the deeper science theory. Uh, but for many years I've taken the option of the latter because the more I see of the universe and the more I see of humanity, the more I think the world is far more mysterious than we give it credit for. So that's why I believe in the resurrection. It may be dissatisfying to atheists who don't believe in God and just think I've gone through some tortuously obscure ho hoops to convince myself something that's very hard to believe. But to my mind something happened, and the evidence of the Apostles shows that. I suppose that is the most important point about this whole process, which is reasonable faith and reasonable doubt. I know plenty of atheists who think that truth is truth and you can load in any amount of assault on it and it will still be the truth. So you could attack the, the notion of the resurrection again and again and again, and if it was true, it would withstand all that attack. But that's not even true for science. If you look at the anti-vaccination movement or the climate change sceptics, you've got perfect evidence for that. If you think that a faith claim has to withstand every possible assault you can make on it, then you're painting yourself into a corner where the only way you can believe something is if you lose an argument. So you need to ask yourself, about how comfortable you are at losing arguments. As we can see uh, with fake news, not even facts can penetrate a closed mind. We have to strike a balance between a closed mind on, a, on one side and a mind so open that your brains fall out on the other. Being able to judge where we draw that line is not a matter of intelligence or knowledge. It is a matter of something far more elusive than those two things wisdom.